When the Civil War began in 1861, North Carolina had a population of about one million people. Of those men, women, and children, approximately one-third were enslaved. Compared with other southern states, North Carolina had relatively few wealthy slaveholding planters. Support for secession was strongest in the eastern part of North Carolina, which had a larger proportion of enslaved people and wealthy slave owners than the central and western regions of the state. Um, when secession came, not all North Carolinians supported it. The movement in North Carolina actually began probably in the 1850s when a fringe group of the Democrat Party, which was the conservative party in North Carolina, began to promote this idea that slavery needed to be defended outside of the Union, that a group of collective states, slaveholding states, needed to be on their own away from the power of the growing Northern uh, Republican Party. So what we see in the 1850s is an incredible growth in North Carolina. The Whig Party, who was sort of the Liberal Party of North Carolina, had brought great reforms to North Carolina starting in the 1830s and really sought to, to bring North Carolina, to make it a modern state of the Union. Yeah, the, the, the derogatory nickname North Carolina was called the Rip Van Winkle State, based on the Washington Irving story about the farmer who fell asleep and woke up 20 years later to find everything had passed him by. That's how the nation saw North Carolina. So the Whig Party instituted a number of reforms, starting with the state constitution in 1835, which expanded voting from North Carolina's white land owning. They also expanded the public school system. They also brought internal improvements to the ports of North Carolina, and most uh, uh, significantly were the railroads, the Raleigh the Gaston Railroad and the North Carolina Railroad, which gave so many access to foreign markets the agricultural production exploded during this time period. So it was a time of great plenty and prosperity and freedom for many North Carolinians. But this national conversation on slavery and the threat to the slave system made many nervous that this prosperity would be threatened. So as this national conversation heated up, more and more North Carolinians began to listen to these calls for disunion. And many began to believe that secession truly was the only option. But again, in North Carolina, it was a very balanced state. You had many, many more who felt that within the Union was the best place to defend slavery and the North Carolinian's way of life. That secession meant not only tearing up that, uh, the very the foundation of the country and the state that North Carolinians had paid a high price for during the Revolution, and to throw that away um, was folly and bred only problems that could be solved in the most dismal of ways. And if you look at North Carolinians, we really held the principles and those revolutionary leaders to our heart. You can see behind me the, the, top, the painting that is a copy of a very famous one done by Thomas Sull. On the grounds of here at the Capitol is another um, uh, statue of George Washington. In 1860, perhaps one of the most the famous sculptures to ever arrive in North America, the, the Antonio Canova statue of George Washington, commissioned by the state, was here in the state capitol. So North Carolinians not only loved Washington, but the essence of the revolution and all of it stood for, and really uh, celebrated the 4th of July long after many southern states had turned their back on this holiday. So when secession came, many North Carolinians viewed it with a suspicious eye about what did it mean what did it mean for the Constitution? What did it mean for the state? And truly, what did it mean for the nation they helped forge and fire? Even though the Whig Party was no longer a national force in 1860, it still was strong in North Carolina, which had excluded Lincoln from its ballot during the election that year. The boiling point for North Carolinians that really heated up came in 1856. The Whig Party, who had basically controlled state politics and a lot of national politics, had begun to fade on this national scene. The Democrat Party began to really take over, and those cries for loudly for the defense of slavery began to ring through the halls of the building we stand in right now. 
1856 was the time when the first time we see a Republican, the new Republican Party ran their first candidate, John C. Fremont. And this began to really make North Carolinians, especially those, those, those state leaders, very nervous about what the Republican Party thought and what they were going to do about the institution of slavery. So in the wake of this election, we see North Carolinians really begin to be very hypersensitive about national politics. For example, uh, the only uh, professor at the University of North Carolina who's actually fired for his political beliefs was a guy named Benjamin Hedrick, who supported John C. Fremont. And once this got out in Chapel Hill and across the state, it created an entire uproar. Now, this also came on the heels of a very influential and inflammatory book published that same year. A fellow named Hinton Rowan Helper published an incendiary book called The Impending Crisis of the South. A native North Carolinian used statistics to show how slave owning did not benefit the South and made the point that slave owning and slavery also repressed so much of the advancement of the white people of North Carolina that these two together really began to boil over this idea of secession and confederacy and leaving the Union. On May 1st, Ellis called a special session of the legislature and ordered seizure of all federal property. On May 20th, North Carolina became the 11th Southern state to leave the Union by a unanimous vote of delegates. Many Unionists, thinking the outcome inevitable, had skipped the convention vote a few days before. They chose that day, May 20th, for a very specific reason. It was the same day in 1775 that Mecklenburg County announced their own Declaration of Independence to leave the British colonies and join the American cause. So North Carolinians saw that as a precedent in their own moving out of the American Union. Now when the vote was cast, a handkerchief was dropped from the window signaling the vote. Cannons were fired, men shouted, women waved flags and handkerchiefs. And it was a very cordial and exciting moment for those who supported secession. Despite its initial reluctance to leave the United States, North Carolina provided a significant number of soldiers and sailors to the Confederate cause, a total of about 130,000 during the course of the Civil War. Several thousand white and black North Carolinians also served in the Union Army and Navy during the protracted and bloody conflict. <laughs> 